Hi, welcome to HK3 News. I am your host, Quentin Baker. Thanks again for tuning in and joining us here today. I have with us today Devlin Steele. He is the all-around cryptocurrency man uh, involved with multiple different projects that most people either have heard about or soon to be hearing about. So, uh, Devlin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Quentin. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome, man. So I want to just get straight to it because uh, I consider you to be very knowledgeable around the uh, cryptocurrency game. But I want everyone else to kind of get on the same page with us as far as what is uh, not just cryptocurrency. We, we've kind of covered that. But how is cryptocurrency being used today? A lot of terms get talked about, like invest into this crypto or to, uh, you know, I, we only accept uh, Dash at this uh, paying outlet that sort of thing and, and all these different ATMs are popping up so just in your view how is crypto being used today as well as you know uh, is it an investment vehicle or is it something different well crypto really isn't being used today so that's kind of a, uh, a game changer it, it will be used so how it's being used is uh, as a vehicle to invest in and many people have put forward different ways to create that investment the original side was, here's a cryptocurrency. It's not attached to any particular management team. It's not uh, attached to any performance of a company. It is just something that people believe in. And that was Bitcoin itself that was put forth as a currency to replace other currencies. Mm -hmm. As blockchain came on and smart contracts came on, it evolved where people said, hey, we have ideas for the future of how this technology can revolutionize and, and change the way people are doing um, business through a decentralized ledger. And they put out cryptocurrencies, again, not attached to performance of companies, but to ideas as fundraisers, as we know them as ICOs. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then that progressed because in the United States, you can't, it, it, it was, unregulated, it was too risky, what does it mean, what are these companies? And so people wanted STOs, which were security token offers. So now these were supposed to be attached to more of an asset or a performance or a management team and white papers and investor rights came into question. And so you see a lot of STOs now. Mm -hmm. And so cryptocurrency as, as what we think of it Think of it more in terms of a coin, a crypto coin. Okay. And you have the blockchain and you have smart contracts. So the crypto itself can represent anything. It can represent a currency. It can represent a utility. It can uh, represent a security. It can represent an asset like real estate. And what we'll see in the future is that financial transactions will actually be more secure, faster, and be able to have greater liquidity and better investor rights through cryptocurrency, but we're not there yet. Gotcha. So when it comes to, and you said a, a key there that, uh, that I want to highlight a little bit, transactions, faster transactions. Uh, as cryptocurrency, as I know it, uh, I've always used it as a transaction vehicle, right? Like the moment that I, I put, almost as if I'm going to another country or something, I put some money into uh, an app like Coinbase or something, buy some crypto, and then I go someplace else, use the crypto, and then I, they more than likely probably transition it into another USD or some other currency at that point. Um, is that kind of how, that's how I've seen crypto be used today, is more of as a transactional vehicle, even though it's been talked about as an investment vehicle. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, that, that is exactly what we're talking about here, is that the, the first generation was a currency transactional application. That's what people were looking to, to uh, fight the governments and bank, central banks and Federal Reserve and the idea of, of currency being controlled and, and not being able to be increased and reprinted and, and more in control of a decentralized ledger. And that, that application and how that's going to go forward, the adoption of that through governments and through how people will transact is going to be very exciting. Gotcha. But when you're talking about an investment, I don't go into a store and say, here's my Apple stock. Let me have that suit. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, investments aren't to 
uh, to be used as currency. And currency isn't supposed to be used as an investment. I mean, how would you feel if you invested in the dollar today and you had a whole bunch of dollars and then what you could buy today cost you twice as much tomorrow and then twice as much the next day or half as I mean, currency needs to be stable via now the stable coins coming out and which are attached to some more stable type of currency where then they don't have the great fluctuations and can be used on a transactional basis with more consistency and security behind it. Now, Which brings up another question, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That and that that question is exactly what I was going to ask. Is what? Well, number one, what makes a stable coin, as what you mentioned before, and you know what are these stable coins? What? what why? It, I'm guessing it's not the famous Bitcoin, as it were, right? No, Bitcoin is is purely based on investor psychology and, and use of it. So the confidence of the crowd determines the price of it. Uh, a, and 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 at the end of the day, the confidence in any investment is determined by the crowd. Supply, demand, confidence. How much we're willing to pay for something, how much we value it, and that creates a push-pull demand on it, and that creates a price mm -hmm. that levels off in 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 that. So, but when we're talking about a stable coin. Think about this: when you when you go to a bank, you put your dollars in the bank, and you're you you feel like your dollars are there. You feel like they're not going to disappear. And what does the bank do? The bank leverages that, goes out, creates ten dollars that they lend out, and therefore there's all this digital money out there that really there's no currency behind. Correct. And if everybody went to the bank and tried to cash out their dollars, it's called a run on the bank, and the bank would collapse. So a stable coin is stable according to how the people who are managing it treat that coin. So every dollar I put into a stable coin is in a bank account against that coin. Then all the dollars are going to be there and the coin is going to go up and down based on the value of that currency. Mm -hmm. The reason why I question a stable coin because the idea of it is great. But are all the dollars there behind the coin? So if the person putting out the company putting out the stable coin is doing the same thing the bank is doing, leveraging it, keeping one dollar of, of real cash available to every ten coins they're putting out there, well, then if everybody needed that cash at the same time, that coin would collapse too. Mm -hmm. So ideas are great, but just like investments, everything out there, crypto is not good or bad. A stable coin is not good or bad. A currency is not good or bad. It's what's behind it. So an STO, who is the management company? What are the investor rights? What are your what are, What are you owning? Are you getting a dividend? Are you how are you participating in the investment? And do you believe the investment is realistic? And just like stocks, you have the OTC, which is very risky, you know, and you have Nasdaq, you have the New York Stock Exchange. And you have different levels of uh, high risk, high reward, low risk, usually lower reward investments. And so at the end of the day, there's no investment that represents anything other than you having to know what you're investing in and doing that, that due diligence. Got that. And, and when it comes to that due diligence, because we're dealing with uh, an STO, a uh, uh, security token offering, uh, different than stocks, you can often find a lot of the information about the company, about the owner, about uh, doing some background checks just through doing some simple Google searches because these IPOs generally have a, a, a wealth of information already out there. With security tokens, you don't need to have all of that. Uh, and so how does somebody actually do their due diligence to kind of see, is this a, a token offering that, you know, if it's backed by the performance of an actual company or uh, of certain product, uh, is there any places that they can find that information or is it kind of just you have to got to know where to look? Twofold. One is, yes, you have to know where to look. But on the other side, what I am hoping to see as, as we move forward is that these STOs release uh, not just white papers that talk about ideas, but in-depth um, uh, backgrounds of the management team, uh, what they want to accomplish, what their 
funding is, uh, what their benchmarks are. You could even have smart contracts that that develop a, a way of releasing funds upon achieving benchmarks. I mean, a, a, imagine someone raises $25 million and they have it all day one. That's what these ICOs did, 50 million, 100 million. Well, they don't, they don't have to achieve any benchmark in order to have access to all that cash. Yeah. So if they make mistakes, they just can keep going forward and the investors have no rights. So we're going to see a lot of changes on this. And I think what's neat about it is that the changes don't have to come from the SEC or regu regulators. They're going to come from people saying, wow, I want to raise money. What does the investor want? How can I produce their confidence to get the money? Mm -hmm. And and that's what's so cool about smart contracts is because we can bake in those investor rights and protocols in the smart contracts, and then the smart contracts achieve the regulation mm -hmm. without because I mean, listen, the SC, all this regulation out there did that stop two thousand and eight and the mortgage debacle? Does that stop? Uh, financial institutions from doing the wrong thing. It almost seems sometimes now that I, I read a recent thing, I won't name the bank, but uh, one of the big <laughs> banks that basically said, um, we're not going to change the way we're doing business. We'll just keep paying fines because <laughs> uh, we consider the cost of doing business because yeah. we make more money paying the fines doing exactly what we're doing. Yeah. So, you know, you know, the SEC and everyone can say, oh, uh, crypto is unregulated, unregulated. The entire crypto market is 115 billion right now. And when you're talking about uh, hundreds of, of, of trillions of dollars in derivatives and other, unreg on other unregulated products. And, and you know, so crypto is, is just evolving. And actually, through the people in it, I believe is going to become more regulated internally by the people. And uh, I know this sounds corny for the people. <laughs> now, what has you have so much confidence in that? Because we, we often see in the history or in past groups of people or teams of people or even, you know, uh, just cohorts get together and try to do self-regulation. And then inevitably, once it grows to a certain size or enough money is involved, government comes in. Uh, what do you, what gives you such confidence that there's going to be a level of, of regulation, a level of responsibility uh, coming out of the groups that are dealing with crypto? I think it's going to work twofold. I think the government is going to come in. I think there are rules that need to apply uh, to all type of financial uh, transactions to protect investors. Mm -hmm. The problem is that our current regulation is based on regulations written in 1933. And I, I, I wouldn't go to a doctor and say, you know, use me a medical practice that was developed in 1933 on me. <laughs> so, you know, regulation has to catch up to new technologies. But what gives me confidence is that uh, people are smart. I, I, people, there's too much information and eventually uh, hype wears out and and water finds its settling point, you know, and 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 in order to get investors and get people on board, there you're going to have to provide these things. And and the guys, the, the companies and, and the teams that are smart are going to try to get ahead of the curve mm. and be there before it needs to be there because they're the ones that are, that are going to get the investments. And there are a lot of smart people out there and they realize there's so much money out there and there's so many ways to raise money mm -hmm. that if you offer investors the right rights and information, they will follow you. And and that's why I believe in it. Now, uh, I want to go a little more personal with you because a lot of your background has to do with helping these these businesses, consulting with them. Are there any projects or things and from what you've seen that, uh, you know, if you were to let's say we have some people that are doing an STO today, some companies that are getting ready to do a, a launch or a raise or something like that. What's some of the advice based off of your experience that you would give them uh, if they're dealing with it, doing a token offering or tokenizing their, their product or services? The, if you're going to raise money, mm -hmm. uh, the first thing I believe you need to do is put yourself in the investor's seat and ask yourself, 
if you were the investor, what rights would you want to have? What information would you want to have? And 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 start from there. Uh, don't. And then also, you know, the the you know, it's do you have a revenue model behind it? Do you have an actual timeline of benchmarks and things that you want to achieve? I mean, there are a lot of big ideas out there of decentralizing the internet and doing many huge, huge things out there. Mm -hmm. And they are achievable, but you know, the timeline on them, five, 10, 15 years, where does that timeline come in? And that's high risk because you could or could not achieve it. And the investor may or may not ever get their money back. Mm -hmm. And that's okay because investors are willing to go after a lot of great projects and fund them. And if they happen, they get the reward. Imagine if you were in on Amazon when everybody told you know Jeff Bezos that no one's ever going to shop online and the stock. Think about this: when yeah. Amazon came out, it actually fell 93 percent of its value. And at that point, everyone said, "You know what? No one's ever going to shop online." <laughs> and and here he is today. Yeah. And, and and the same is true with so many industries. Think about the cell phone and the smartphone, and mm -hmm. we all go through this progression of of that's why this eighty five percent dip that happened in two thousand eighteen is really irrelevant. It's part of the uh, of the curve of adoption, and th these are normal processes, and we're going to get to where uh, McKinsey just put out a report, 88% of all leaders of companies in all industries believe that if they don't adopt some form of blockchain protocols, they will not be competitive. 80%. And our future is gonna be voting through blockchain, our documentation through blockchain, our health records through blockchain. I mean, blockchain is a reality, and then how that um, circles back and interweaves with financial transactions and currencies is a uh, uh, a living story that will reveal itself, but it's going to be. Got that. And let's talk actually a little bit about some of those use cases you're mentioning from medical records and um, those various different types. What are some of the use cases that you're looking forward to uh, when it comes to DLT manifesting a whole new way of doing things? Well, Im imagine all your health records are on the block. Mm -hmm. And so now, instead of asking your doctor when you move ta when you move to a new city or you go to a new doctor, you got to get records, faxed, emailed. You got to get copies. You got to go through administrators. You got to go through phone operators to get to the right person. You spend days getting things done, and then when you get to the doctor, guess what? They still don't have the records. Yeah, you know, yeah. and. We all go through this and we all go through this frustration and it's inefficient and it, it means that somebody's controlling your information and you have to ask permission to get your information where you want it, when you want it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, yeah. all the information can be on the block and you simply and you have the keys to that information and you go to your new doctor and you boom, there they are. They're there the second you're there. And this is the type of future, it's less expensive, you don't need administrators, it's faster, it's easier, it's actually more secure. And this type of, of, decent, of decentralized ledger and progression of blockchain, we're going to see in shipping records and shipping manifest, we'll be able to see from, from seed to, uh, to uh, in our supermarkets where food came from. So we'll be able to isolate if, if something went wrong and, and where that outbreak came from and we'll be able to fix it faster. I mean, this is, we could talk a long time about this. <laughs> well, and actually you're bringing up a good point that, that I often get sometimes when I've done consultations is what's out there right now that allows for that capability to happen and why aren't we using that? Is it just we don't have that out there right now? Or why is there such this, you know, breakthrough when it comes to blockchain or DLT technology when we have a bunch of different database systems out there right now? We have a different, um, a bunch of supply chain management operations. Why aren't we doing this currently? Well, the supply chain uh, management systems that you're referring to require uh, communication between them, require administrators making sure the communication is there 
and the records are moving back and forth. When, whenever you have a centralized source of information that needs to communicate with another centralized source of communication, well, then you have people behind it. And you have, you know, you, it, it always becomes slower and it's, it's not as transparent. It's not as quick. We're talking about a technology now that allows for a decentralized ledger where everything is attached. You don't have to, you don't have to figure out how to attach it or how to get the information there. The information will be there and it will follow the process all the way through. Now, is there any concerns? Uh, what would you say to someone that has a concern around security? We've had a number of uh, security issues come up when it comes to large populations of data and identifications. Some companies I won't mention here uh, that have been breached or have been circumvented. When it comes to this type of technology and some of the processes and use cases you're talking about, like medical records, that's very sensitive information. What would you say to someone around that? What would I say about that is that uh, security, if you think the, the blockchain is going to make you less secure, um, the security breaches that happen today in, in, in our visa records, in, in, in our financial records, in all our records are happening all the time. They don't, uh, they publicize them now and then, they make a big deal about them now and then, mm -hmm. but on a daily basis they're happening and you never hear about them. Mm. And the thing about crypto and blockchain is that the news and media, this is, it, it brings up a lot of emotion of insecurity. It's a hype. And so everything goes under the spotlight. I, without a doubt, believe that this is going to make everyone more secure and put in a better place. So, and, and, and at the end of the day, read the technology, get into the technology this is going to provide greater security and a faster, easier way to transfer information and do transactions. And it is going to be in, in, in five years from now, just like we don't talk about how amazing the smartphone is anymore or how amazing online shopping is anymore. Mm -hmm. In five or so years, I think it's going to be pretty quick, actually. We're not going to even be talking about if blockchain is relevant, we're just, it's just going to be part of all of our lives. What do you think, uh, if we're talking about what we're going to be talking about, what do you see by the standing in December of 2019, what do you think that we will be talking about when it comes to DLT and cryptocurrencies that we should keep an eye on? Well, the future is very interesting uh, <laughs> because change is going to happen very fast. Mm -hmm. A lot of change. We have robotics that I don't think people understand where robotics really, the development and the stage it's in. Mm -hmm. We have our artificial intelligence and then we have blockchain and autonomous cars. Mm -hmm. So all of these are going to really change the way we live, the way cities are constructed. You're not going to see, just from a building point of view, you're not going to see as many parking lots and, and need for garages and things of that nature with autonomous cars. Mm -hmm. You're going to see um, mid-level and, and white-collar jobs get wiped out by robotic and artificial intelligent processing that will do a lot of the administrative work and billing and, and so many jobs, even in legal and banking and finance. So the world is going to be changing. And you know, it, where it's going to be sitting in 10, 15 years is going to be a very interesting uh, development. But we all think it's, it's so fast. If you think about 1875 to 1925, hmm. those 50 years, in those 50 years, uh, the light bulb, uh, electricity, uh, the car, the train, um, uh, speeding the, the train tracks and the development of that, the airplane, all of these things uh, created a complete change of communities, how we live, how we transported ourselves. Uh, uh, everything changed in those 50 years. There was this amazing amount of change that's even greater than the change that we're experiencing now as far as how people live where they chose to live, how they got to work, how long they worked, the quality of work, uh, and then think about all the progression of rights and, you know, the, uh, the rights for women to vote, the right, you know, civil liberties and everything we've gone through. There's always been a lot of change. 
-hmm. And now we're going to see a, a lot of changes happening in the next 15, 20 years that I think are going to be very positive. People are scared about them because who's going to do what and how is work going to be created. Sure. But I do believe man has always found the creative side of how to adopt technology to lifestyle and create jobs and, and move forward as, as, a, as a human race. So I'm excited about it. Is there any specific uh, jobs that you think some of our younger generation should be looking forward to? I get kids now asking, you know, what crypto should I be investing in? Or should I learn how to code? Or, you know, what, what's, the next, you know what's next for the next generation when it comes to creating jobs or creating a level of security in the economic environment that's happening in the next two to three years? Do you have any advice for them? Well, blockchain developers is the number one job uh, sought for on LinkedIn right now. Everyone's looking for good blockchain developers. Uh, so, you know, if you're just getting into it, that is a, a field that is going to be in high demand. Mm -hmm. uh, but where, you know, all these jobs are going to um, evolve to from, you know, technically keeping up with robotics, creative, engineering, uh, the adoption of all this new technology and the development of it. I think one has to be broad. You know, I don't know if there are jobs that go 20, 30, 40 years like in the past. So one has to be constantly adopting and growing and looking at the environment and be flexible. So, you know, it's, it's difficult to exactly say, uh, but if you're educated and you're creative, and and you stay flexible and you're willing to work you're always going to find your way got that awesome any uh before we wrap up is there any exciting projects that you're currently working on that maybe we should be aware of a uh, couple of things you asked about about investing and stos and things like that uh, i just want to say one quick thing is that you got to remember that the cryptos today and the investments of today might not even be the investments of tomorrow mm -hmm. yet you know, if you look at the uh, friend finder to MySpace to Facebook mm -hmm. technology, uh, the, the starting ones don't necessarily be the ones that end up to be the ones. Sure. So it's very difficult. Anyone who says they're an expert or claims they know in, a, in an industry that is evolving and changing on a daily basis. I mean, it's uh, being in crypto is like living on top of a, an earthquake. Constantly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the ground is changing all the time and you got to be adopting to it. So how can you be when you don't know what the ground is going to look like tomorrow? How can you be an expert on it? Sure. So you got to be one who is very adoptable and ready to go. I, I'm involved with a, a project that is trying to exactly uh, take those smart contracts and alternate assets and really protect the investor in a way that will create that security and give people who want to raise money or uh, a, a way of connecting with the investor and the investor with the projects in a fluid manner with more security. And when we when I have more to share on that in the next couple of months, I'll definitely uh, uh, come back and talk to you about it. <laughs> well, I can't wait for that, actually. So, uh, Mr. Steele, thank you so very much for your time here today, Devlin. It's an honor to be able to sit and chat with you. We're definitely going to have you on again soon so we can talk more about that project. And for all of our viewers, please tune in next time. We're going to be discussing a little bit more, not just on blockchain, but on other technologies as well and the startup culture. And don't forget to subscribe and like at the bottom of the video here. We'll be creating additional links for you to find out more to come. So thank you so much for checking into Edge K3 News. Devlin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Quentin, and congratulations on your show and oh. all, all the success with it. <laughs> thank you so much, man. All right, well, have a great one, y'all.